And now you might think, uh, what lab? Because pop lab is not a term that we use that often, but it's a term that we are trying to use more often. Especially because the whole lab writers community is actually very much tuned into this concept of pop labbing. So to uh, explain the term pop lab, I will try to talk about a similar word called pop art. You might have heard about this. If you have heard about it, you might associate it with a, an artist like Andy Warhol. I think most of you know Andy Warhol, even though if you haven't heard about pop art. What Andy Warhol did, or one of the things that he became famous for, was to take a, an image of an everyday object and then reproduce it over and over again. Uh, th this was the 60s, so the, pe like, the main people, the sophisticated people's perception of art was this paintings that had been painted for hours of hours, they only existed in one uh, copy, and that made it special. But and Warhol came from the advertising industry, so he took what he knew from there, and then he reproduced the, a very simple design matrix, and the reproduction of it made it art. <coughs> It didn't have to be the same art piece every time. He changed a bit here and there. Sometimes it was the consent of the uh, or the content, the content of the can. Sometimes it was the color and the mood. But the matrix was the same. So if we take it to pop labs, we can argue that pop labs are labs that are being designed to be rerun. The design has to be designed to make it. Uh, be runnable and to dis, uh, support the repetition. No matter what kind of lab design you do, you normally start out with an idea, then you have a design phase, you go into a production phase, and that hopefully you just stop the design phase uh, before you stop the production phase, because <laughs> you normally need to know a lot of things in the production phase. But when you've done this, you have a lab. You run the lab. But when you do rerunnable design, you have several labs after this design phase. And each lab will be a bit, a little different because it might not be in the same space, it might not be with the same players, and all of this changes the experience, but the, but the design matrix is the same. So you've already played a lot of these types of LARPs because that, those are the ones that we run on the summer school. These have been run many times before. These have been run, I think, maybe for every single summer school. So all of the alumni approximately have played these LARPs, even though they are only played with 10 or 20 people. So how do we design rerunnable LARPs? This is what I'm going to talk about today. The first thing you do is design for sustainability. And now you're thinking, why on the earth would you want to talk about melting ice cap and our CO2 footprint and solar energy panels? But I'm not. But what most people listen or hear when I say sustainability is the CO2-friendly uh, design, windmills, solar panels. When I, in my everyday life, work with sustainability, I have to think about economic sustainability and social sustainability as well. I can easily do, easily do a building which is completely CO2-neutral. I can plaster the whole roof too with solar panels. I can put a windmill on top of it, I can uh, ins or isolate, insulate the, the facade so no energy ever slips out. But if this makes the building so expensive that the rent will become too high and no people will move into it, then this building is using energy that no one is actually gaining anything from. So the sustainability in this design is to make all of these things work together so that when I'm finished with the design, I can step away and the energy will run itself, it will, uh, it, will, it will suffice itself, the economic will run itself because the people moving in there and creating life there will pay rent and that will, that will pay for the energy and the energy will make it more social because people will want to move that and, or use that and so it goes on. So sustainable design is not about solar energy or a lot of money, it's about being able to create a design that will not fall apart when you stop touching it. <laughs> so how do we do that in design process with LARPs? Because luckily you don't have to think about 
polar bears and melting ice caps, but you do, however, have some other things you need to consider. And that, in particular, is time, money, and resources. And you have this in different groups. You have to think about it for you as yourself as a designer. Maybe you have organizers, because if we are doing rerunnable LARPs, we are not always putting them up themselves. If we are able to step back and have other people run it, that will really be sustainable. So we have to think about their time and resources. We also have to think about the players' time and resources. How much do you need your players to bring before they can actually play the LARP? And then you have to think, figure out what technical resources do you actually have? Do you have an entire equipped black box or do you only have like a classroom? You can choose that all of this should have a lot of it, all of it, and all of these are connected. If I want uh, a lot of resources, I have to put a lot of time in it as an organizer and I can require more time for my players. But if I don't, if I don't put a lot of time and money in it as, a, as an organizer and I, don't, I only uh, use a, a classroom, then the players will wonder why they should put like, a lot of money and a lot of time in it. So say, for instance, we want to do this kind of design. We want to maximize out on all of the time and resources and money and everything. We want to create a LARP in Poland about Harry Potter. So we, this, is, this is definitely possible, and we can rerun this LARP again and again. We only need 11 organizers working full time. We just need a castle in Poland and uh, 150 players who can all afford a ticket, which is approximately 200 to 300 euros. We only need costumes for all of the players. Um, yeah, so it's definitely possible. But if we take one of these things out of this mill, it all falls apart. It's not going to be like you can put this design up online and then someone else is going to think, great, I'm going to do this LARP in Poland. I'm going to quit my everyday job. I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna take uh, 10 of my friends with me and make them quit their everyday job. We, get, we can easily get a castle in Poland because we don't need the context that the other people have. And then, well, finding fifth, like 100 people with a lot of money shouldn't be that possible, should it? It might be, and it might not be sustainable for other people to run this LARP. We can go the completely other direction. We can minimize everything. So it's really, really easy. Like, you don't need that many resources, you, can, you, don't, you hardly need any time, and your players don't either. This could be a, an example of this. This is instant LARP, one, two, three LARP. And this is a LARP that I found on the, online. Actually, all we need for this LARP can fit into this slide. <laughs> and you might not be able to read it, but it's not that important. We basically just need to read this, figure out a, a setting, like, okay, we can play it here. This will be a medieval castle. We all need a character, we need one secret, and then we can LARP it. We, then we need a timer to set for one hour, and then we can begin. So this is really, really easy for anyone to pick up and go home and say, well, do you want to come over to my place on Friday evening, do a bit of LARP, and then have a dinner and drink some beer? Very, very easy. So when it comes to sustainable design, less is more sustainable. Like, the less you have to put in of energy, the easier it is to take and rerun. Now, does this mean that we should only do really, really simple design, and we can never do anything with lights and stages and elephants and whatever we are dreaming about secretly? No, because that would be boring. So that brings us to the next part, which is flexibility. And with flexibility, I mean being able to scale within these different areas. Scale within how much time and energy you use as an organizer, or how much time and energy the players need, or how, how many resources and technical stuff you need. But in order to be able to do this, I will uh, tap into one thing that I did just said. You need to be able to tell what is actually the premise and the essence of your LARP and what belongs to the atmosphere. The essence of your LARP is the things that creates the, ex the experience. It's the thing that if you take this away, the LARP will fall apart. While the things that are surrounding the atmosphere of the LARP has more to do with how it affects the feeling of the LARP. The feeling of the LARP will change if we take 
a LARP from a classroom to a castle. But the things that we do in the LARP might be exactly the same. So this might be a bit weird or uh, difficult to comprehend. So I, I wanted to do a case study. And this is uh, Borderline, which is my first LARP. So we're going to pull this LARP apart to do it more flexibly. Um, when I designed Borderline, I was inspired by a movie called Nostalgia. Or I actually didn't have an idea for a LARP, but I wanted to make a LARP. So I decided that I should do this on Nostalgia, which was this movie. And this movie has many themes, but this uh, Russian writers travel around. Italy tries to figure out the meaning of life and everything. And one of the themes that I really felt was important was this whole inner conflict of who am I? Am I the Russian writer who loves the land, or am I this, uh, uh, this traveled soul who travels around Italy? I wanted this inner conflict of identity to be a theme of the LARP. And then in the movie, there is a very beautiful scene at the end of the movie where this writer, instead of going back to Russia because he needs to get a new uh, visum, yeah. he, uh, he suddenly feels like he has to go to this holy place, this uh, pool where people come to, to cleanse their body, heal their body, without bathe in these hot pools. He goes there because he has this urge to carry a candle from one end to the other. Like this whole action of carrying this candle is suddenly the key to figuring out everything he has tried to figure out all this all the way through this movie. And this movie sequence is probably like 11 minutes of this person trying to carry the candle all across this pool, which is, has been empty because they are cleaning it. And every time it goes out, he's like frustrated. He has to go back and light the candle again and then try to get to the end. He does get to the end. And uh, the movie is from 83, so I, I guess I can do a spoiler. Mm -hmm. When he <laughs> reaches the end, he uh, takes a final breath and dies. So it's really, really beautiful. And that was what I wanted to do with this LARP. Now, you know that most LARPers like to interact with other people when they LARP. So the whole one player LARP was a bit, I thought it would be difficult for me to get players to that. So I decided that I needed two players to act out the inner conflict and they should carry this candle between them and the candle would be the key point of this communication and whether or not the or the negotiation failed or not, whether it was successful. I needed them to carry this. I needed the pilgrimage, but I don't want to just put out the players in one end of the room and then say you just need to go to the other end and then when you reach that that's the end of the lot because that would that seemed like I don't know weird to me. So I designed a circular labyrinth. So instead of going to one end to the other, I needed all of the players to go from the perimeter of this circular labyrinth into the center. The, la the labyrinth was, was divided into pieces like a cake so every player couple could have their own piece and they could they didn't have to interact with each other. And then they should seek out this center of the, the core of the identity by bringing in the candle to the center. That was the pilgrimage, that was the essence of the LARP. Then I added stage light in the center to make it more uh, sacral or holy, the whole experience. I recorded sound from the, movies, from the movie to create this soundscape that would inspire the interaction. And I had a pool of water in the middle because there's a lot of water in this movie and I wanted to add that to the setting. Now, so this is actually how it looks. In reality, this is how it looks. The pool of water became a bit weird, but um, yeah, that's the resources. Try to build a pool of water. Stage lights we probably have, but pool of water is something that you suddenly have to build and wasn't very well prepared for that. But this was how it looked in the first one. I had all of these things. The second run, and I've only done twice, was a Gansalan this year. And it looked like this. The room was smaller, so the labyrinth was, was more tight. The players were tighter together, and I removed the pool of water because I didn't want to try to build a pool of water and then transport it to Norway. <laughs> so that was the first thing that was uh, removed from the design to make it more accessible for myself. 
if I'm honest, I could remove several other things. I could remove the stage light because it doesn't have any design technical issue. It doesn't have any effect besides bringing the atmosphere. I can also take away the sound because even though I know that the sound affects the player's uh, experience in this LARP, they, I can remove it and they will still exactly do the same thing. So what I actually need now is I need a dark space or place because no one says that this has to be inside. I need a candle for two players so that they can hold it and I need matches to, lit the, to light this candle. And then I need chalk to draw the labyrinth. Now this is actually really, really simple resources to get and it doesn't take that much time. I, could, I might even be able to do this in a parking lot at night. I don't have, a black, I don't have to have a black box. So the flexibility here is that you can still add the stage light and the soundtrack and you can build a pool of water and have that and they will all apply something to the experience but you can also take them away and the essence of the light is the same. So that was, I, I tried to do the flexibility exercise with my own. I have to uh, see if I can be more honest with my own design in the future. Now, okay, so we've considered the resources. We've considered my resources and my players' resources. We've taken away all of the things that we don't actually need, but we can add if we want to. Is this now a rerunnable LARP? Yes. No. For you. <laughs> because it's not accessible. It only exists in my hood, so only I can run it. Because I have never <coughs> written it down or published it or make, made it possible for other people to take the design and then take it back home and put it up in their place. So that is the final thing that we need before our LARPs are completely rerunnable, is to write it down publish the manuscript so that other people can download it from the internet and put it up. So to recap all of this that I've just said, no, before, we need a reason for you to do all of this work. <laughs> and that is the why question. Why do we want to run, to design rerunnability? Well, first of all, we get to play a lot more LARPs if they are more accessible. But most importantly, we get to learn from each other. Because all of you and all of us have some sort of experience with us. But unless we go and talk with you at the moment, we don't get it out from you. But if we're able to download your script, see what, you, what kind of design choices you have done, we can easily learn from your experience. So in this way, we learn together as a community and we get so much better and so much faster. Another community which has done this particularly well is the festival community in Denmark where there are probably a thousand scripts online with the scenarios that are, and they are communicated to be run by someone else than the designer. They're community, com communicated to a game master. And the concept is that uh, most of the designers don't normally even run their own scenarios. The scripts are very long, so that is not very accessible. But that is because it's very scripted kind of genre. We, we, our genre is not that scripted, it's much more experimental. So I really do believe that we can write down these things and, don't let, and, and have them not fill like 100 pages. So that is the motivational factor. So one, two, three, pop lab design. Design for sustainability. Consider the time and resources and have all of them uh, work together and less is more. Two, flexibility. See what you can actually take away from the design and then you can always put them back in if you have them. And three, accessibility, write it down. If you want to find inspiration on scripts and uh, what other people have done for designs, there are actually a few, uh, a few pop labs online already on the chambergames.wordpress.com and that is where the instant lab is for instance. Um, and you can go there and you can look at the scripts and then find inspiration if you're stuck or if you need uh, to know what other people have done with a clever solution for a difficult design choice. So that was popular. <laughs>